I kind of created my own, you know, because when I when I went to B, I was already with BC Rich, but I suggested to them that they make flying bees, um, because I liked BC Riches. Um, they had the longer scale, you know, they got 24 frets. They had all the electronics that were hot, you know, in the eighties. So I went to the owner, Bernie Rico, and I said, you know, why don't you guys make a flying bee? Cause I'll play it. And I still have the second one they ever made. First one went to one of his sons. <laughs> but other than that, I've got the second one. What do you think is the magic about the bee guitar? Is it the shape, the look or the feeling? The sound? Uh, for me, it would be more of a look thing. Um, you know, ever since day one, you know, Gibson Les Pauls are nice guitars, Fender Strats are nice guitars, but I knew I didn't want to play those because everybody played them. <clears throat> I wanted to play something that was somewhat unique to me, even though, you know, looking back, you think Michael Schenker, or you think K.K. Downing, you know, but, and that's, that's all the, the Gibson Flying B, you know, which started all that stuff. But um, then the different companies started making them and they started making them more pointy, like I always felt they should be. Um, and it's just, to me, it's a vibe kind of thing because, um, you know, other guitars, like I said earlier, historically sound good. You know, they're, they're fine for everything. I mean, you even talk about the SG. It used to be what Tony Iommi always played and Angus SG, you know? Um, but like I said, I knew I didn't want to do that. I wanted, I wanted something more edgy and a V is definitely more edgy. Who was the first V player that you come in mind? <clears throat> top of my head, top of my head, Michael Schenker, probably. Everybody mentions it. <laughs> yeah. Well, everybody, I mean, everybody loved UFO. Yeah. Um, I mean, after that, you could say, you know, Rudy Shanker, because he played him. Um, and then probably beyond that, I would say KK, because I was a big Priest fan. You know, when Slayer was playing clubs and doing covers, you know, we would cover metal songs, because that's what we liked. Um, yeah, we did everything. We did. We did. Deep Purple, you know, Highway Star, obviously, the, the thrashier song of theirs. Um, we covered Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, Black Sabbath, obviously all that stuff. So it's what I was a fan of, and Jeff as well, plus the, the punk element a little bit. Um, and we kind of fused those two together, and that's what we are today. I don't, I, it was a long, long time ago. So I'm just going to go with what I think happened. <laughs> um, I probably, back then you would just go to, in, in America, we call them mom and pop record stores, you know, because the chains didn't have anything we were looking for. So there was a place, I can't even remember what it was called, a place in Long Beach out by Jeff's house. Um, then we would go there and they would get what we called then imports because you couldn't get them here. Um, and we'd roll the dice. You know, and one of the ones I got was, I can't even remember what, I told King Diamond this when I was on tour with him a few months ago. Um, I got the EP, I don't even remember what it's called, but I got the EP that had the four songs on it. Um, and I'm like, man, this is really cool. You know, and me and Jeff were really into it. And then we got the full record, Melissa, and still one of my favorite records of all time. And I got to play with King, eight shows this last summer, I played Evil. Great song, eight, eight shows. That was, if you told 17-year-old Carrie King that I was going to be on stage with King Diamond playing Merciful Fate songs someday, I would have said, fuck off, no way, you know? <music> that, that whole record, it's wonderful. And it just gets in your head. Once you hear it once, you just sing it for like seven days. It's from the, the next record, it's Gypsy. Big, big, heavy riff. And I was learning that on Mayhem, just in case King Diamond wanted to try to play it one day. <laughs> we didn't do it, but maybe someday. Do we have a, a favorite solo part, theme part from the Melissa? I really like the intro. 
you know, the, um, when the lead comes in. Yeah. Because the lead gives you every ounce of emotion that that song's about, and it just sets it up. Yeah, we played those two records till, till our cassettes probably broke. You know, <laughs> we, were, we were so into it. I mean, I, I call Hella Waits, yeah. the merc- I call it the Merciful Fate record. Because we were so influenced by Merciful Fate, you'll see in our career, we never have records with seven or eight songs, and they're all long as hell. And there's, you know, incredible amounts of, of tempo changes. But we were so influenced and inspired by Merciful Fate. We didn't sound like them, but that's why that record is. And some people, that's their favorite record, and maybe that's why. But I think the next record, Rain and Blood, is where Slayer found Slayer sound and went with it from there. talked about you you made your own V design what is your favorite color on the, on the V what is the perfect V guitar for you I got so many nice ones now <clears throat> um, right now like the newest one I'm not sure if I'm gonna open with it today because I like to sound check and know what the stage sounds like before I use that particular one but um, it's one of my newer ones it's a matte black yeah. with um, the tribal is gloss. So it's real striking. Um, one of my favorite ones over the years, it's got like a fire background and it's got the tribal design on top of it. The tribal's, you know, linked to me. Um, it's like branded to me. Um, so I just try to think of different ways, you know, to do backgrounds, different ways to um, present the tribal, you know, I just try to keep them thinking, you know, there's like two or three main styles and I try to think of whatever ways I can make paint jobs on them. Like when I first got them, it was like a black background with silver tribal. And then it evolved into like a marble background with whatever color tribal I could think of that looked good on it. Um, And then we went to fire background, which is one of my favorites. And then the newest one, like I said, is a matte black background for me. What kind of pickups do you use? It, that's a, a, a signature uh, pickups too. You EMGs, um, I think it's 81, 85. Yeah. You know, you know when you're checking stuff out and you find what you what you like, you know what it's called. But then you don't address it for like 15, 20 years and forget what it's called. But I'm pretty sure my set is the 81, the 85. I once heard a guy uh, said that... Uh, Guitar players are the most conservative people in the world. They not often change their instrument when they first got their own sound. Just ask for your black ball. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's coming back this summer. I, I hope I'm over here for some of his shows. Yeah, I think- I've been using Marshalls since... I could afford them because <laughs> in the beginning, you know, you just wanted to have cabinets behind you just to show, you know, we've got all these speakers. We're awesome. You know, that's how that's how metal kids thought back then. Um, so, you know, we'd buy cheap shells and put our own speakers in it. Um, and it, it definitely, you know, did the job. But, you know, as soon as we could afford Marshalls, that's the way we went. Um, and through history, <clears throat> the one I, I used until I got my own was uh, 800, JCM 800. Yeah, the classic one. And back then I used 6550 tubes in them. Yeah. Um, and then I was one of the lucky guys that got to um, design my own head. Um, and it was based, the tribal. Yeah, 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 and it was based on, see, you know, the tribal, it's branded to me. <laughs> um, and we basically took my 800 and I had them dissect because I had, you know, I had a number of 800s, but one was always the one. And so I, I sent that to the factory. <clears throat> and what I found out was, you know, they had their electricians look at it and everything. And like everything's got, you know, a little window. It could be from, you know, here to here. And it, it passes, so to speak. Um, and all mine were straight up dead center, all the little things. So it was like the perfect head. So we had my head that I put out based on the 800. And we put in a, a gain and we put in a gate. So in doing that, I basically, I, I designed it so back then we'd, we'd have trouble getting um, equipment through customs in South America sometimes. And when I designed this head, 
I wanted it to be that if my gear didn't make it, I can go to any store that has that head, pick it up, plug in and play. Yeah, and so many people like it. Um, <laughs> it's, it's incredible. Lita Ford's got one. You know, my friends in Macedon, um, Bill plays one. He used to play one live. I don't know if he does anymore, but it's, it's weird the people that get enjoyment and the sound they want out of my head. You know, it's kind of fulfilling. It's still primitive. It's still primitive like if I was 16. You know, I got a little piece of shit practice amp over here and you know, if I get something I like anymore, I just turn on my phone and record it on my phone. <laughs> Simple, as that. Simple as that. Simple as that, yeah. It's easy now to do less shit. Very, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, there's things, there's things that, um, like there's this thing called an amp plug. And you just plug it into your guitar and headphones plug right into it yeah. and it distorts like quality metal, you know, and I could just make riffs up like that. And then all you hear, if you don't have the headphones on is strings, you know, you just hear like electric guitar with strings, but I can put my phone right in my lap and hear what I'm doing and know that it sounds heavy as fuck. But you know, my recording's just picking up the, the acoustic um, sound of it, but it, it allows me to rem remember what I want. What did you do 20 years ago? Man? Dude, up until like five years ago, I still used a cassette tape and a piece of shit Radio Shack mic. <laughs> just dangle it in front of the... Actually, just put it on the floor in front of the practice amp. And then tape it on cassette tape. You know, for a long time, I still did it on cassette tapes. Because that's how I grew up doing it, you know. And then, you know, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, you got the four-track uh, test. I never got that much, man. No? No, just that rectangular one that had all the buttons on the end. Go Record. That's the easiest way you might do Yeah, I did that. I, I did that up until at least God hates us all. At least. Maybe even the next one. But if, you, if one is comfortable about doing that, like, like Yeah, it like works. That. It works. I know. I mean, it, it was it was a pain in the ass finding riffs on 45 minute long cassette tapes, you know? <laughs> but that's how I did it. The only real memory I have, I mean, aside from being into the music, um, we got to see him that one time in 85. And I've got, I come across pictures every once in a while because we were doing an in-store signing. It was me, I think it was all of us, and King was there. And you get, there's a picture of us from like 85 at this store. And it's really cool to come back and come across that. And I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot that happened. You know, because so many things happen and on a daily basis for me, you know, 30 years worth of things. So, you know, you, you do forget things. I remember, this is a funny story. One time early on, you know, um, I was somewhere with Slash. And I was telling my friends or whoever was handling me that day, I'm like, man, I'm going to go say hello to Slash and meet Slash, you know, be cool. And just before I did it, Slash, come in, up some, Slash comes up to me and says, hey, Carrie, how you been? I went, fuck, when did I meet Slash? <laughs> it must have been some party and I was, you know, wasted or something. But I'm like, man, this is probably the first time Slash is going to hear this if he watches this. But um, so the second time I saw Slash, I was going to introduce myself and apparently I already knew him. It's hard to say, you know, um, because what was popular as metal when I was younger is still popular, but now there's so many other different kinds of metal. I think, I think metal will endure. I think metal will you know, continue. Um, all my heroes are coming to what I know is the end. I know Black Sabbath's talking about this being the end, I think. Um, and I think ACDC and Priest, you know, much as I love them, I know they're not going to do it forever. Um, and then it's up to us to do it for a little bit longer. We're not much younger than them. Um, like the big four era, Metallica, us, um, Megadeth and Anthrax, and all of our 
you know, associates, Testament, Exodus. Um, you know, I think, I think it'll just keep evolving. Um, and hopefully someday there'll be a new Black Sabbath. Yeah. That would be, that would be awesome. That would be an in, incredibly hard thing to achieve, but you know, I know that, that history repeats itself. So hopefully that happens. Michael, he's, uh, has his own record shop in Copenhagen. I heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shit, I should have went. Yeah. I had two days off, see? I don't even, you don't think of stuff. Uh, a vinyl. You know, all I did, let me tell you what I did on my day off. We found a Christmas village, had bratwurst and crepes. I think I could have found time to go to a record store. <laughs> yeah. You should have, man. I, sh I didn't even think of it. You can find all the old records down there. I got, yeah. I've still got all my records from when I was, you know, 17 to 20 when I was getting, I still got all that vinyl in my house. As a matter of fact, I just had my wife take my original Melissa picture disc. I had two of them because they were so cool. Um, I got two because they were numbered. I'm like, fuck yeah, I want two. So she took those two, um, my Melissa album and my Don't Break the Oath album. And King Diamond was playing near our house. So she took them. I'd, I was going to have it done when we were on Mayhem, but... I didn't feel like traveling with my vinyl, so I had my wife take it while we were here on this run. So yeah. she said he wrote a book on each one, so I got to go home and read and see what he says. 